You're watching LMCC. Thank you for coming out tonight to hear about Lake Minnetonka as a Native American place. 13,000 years ago, there was a glacier here, <laughs> and it was a mile thick. So remember to coordinate your time machine if you go back and land up there. It is thought that when the glacier melted, people came immediately after, hunting a uh, large game, and they continued to inhabit this area that we now call Minnesota until now. We may be the end of, it, of civilization, but um, <laughs> in between these dates, 500 BC or before the uh, Christian era to 1500, the uh, people that lived here built earthworks, which we think of as mounds. Some of them were quite large. This photograph shows the mounds in, the, in Mound Park in St. Paul, which is a, probably the most sensational uh, site in the state. As you go down the Mississippi River, there are uh, increasingly extravagant earthworks. Uh, but we have a few here that are, are fairly um, interesting. And if you look at Lake Minnetonka, it's got a strong concentration of, of mounds or earthworks. Now, I use the word earthworks because not all of them, when you say mound, you think of a um, kind of a spherical structure, but many of them were elongated, uh, various shapes. Some in Minnesota were what we call effigy mounds, which means they were in the shape of animals, birds, were very common, and all, all kinds of quadrupeds. So this map shows uh, the mounds that were surveyed in 1883, and those I believe are the white ones. Uh, the red dots indicate intact mounds, and uh, then the uh, orange indicates partial slash unknown mound conditions. So quite a concentration. The, um, the, I should say too, the white ones indicate clusters. So very often these mounds were in uh, groups. Here's one on Big Island. We'll talk about this very mound that happens to be falling over the bluff uh, in a moment. Kathy Endress, uh, former president here of the uh, Historical Society and I went out and looked at this one. Same, same mound is in the last slide. And then here are two that, were, that are also on Big Island. Um, in the foreground, you can see uh, a mound, and see many of these mounds are not very high. They're very difficult to detect, in fact. Maybe a foot high, two feet high, three feet high is very common. Then in the background, we have a slightly larger mound back here. Both of these mounds have been obviously excavated. They're cratered. Uh, the people that excavated them didn't bother to refill them. And uh, it is said by contemporary sources that by about 1890, all of the mounds at Lake Minnetonka had been excavated. It's interesting that that was, it was not seen as the crime that it is today. In fact, in the 1860s, the Minnesota Historical Society encouraged people to open mounds, to recover artifacts that might be found um, because the sense was that they were all going to be lost to erosion and agriculture. This mound group is not very far from here. It's over in Tonka Bay, about three miles to the west. Uh, this was a map that was published in the uh, Smithsonian Proceedings in 1871, I think, or 73. And I have um, colored it. and given it a cant so that north is straight up. Um, it, those of you who bicycle in this area know this bike trail. It's an old railroad that went from Excelsior to St. Bonifacius. And this is County Road 19. And here's, this marsh is today the 
Manitou ball fields in Tonka Bay. So up at the upper right, falling off the screen, is Peter Gideon's house on Gideon's Bay, and his orchard is here. So this is an interesting structure. There are, I don't know how many mounds, lots of mounds, and they're clearly laid out in, a, in what looks like it might be an attempt to create an effigy structure. And these are, I think, all gone. Um, Gideon, Peter Gideon, of course, is well known in Minnetonka history for developing uh, a particular apple called the Wealthy that was very popular in Minnesota horticulture. And he, there's also uh, a story about him protecting these mounds and preventing them from being excavated. Another uh, group that was uh, prominent and excavated early uh, was the group on uh, Starvation Point. Does anybody know what that's called today? Brackets? I, I call it Orono. Is that, I mean, isn't it called Orono Point? Forgive me. I, uh, anyway, it's up on the lake, halfway to Wyzetta, and it had uh, several prominent mounds on it. Now, these mounds were not always reliquaries where uh, human remains are found. And it, uh, really uh, intense analysis of the mounds done about 12 years ago uh, looked at all the literature that could be found on every mound in Minnesota and determined that only about two thirds of them uh, re produced human remains. And so it's really unclear I mean, obviously they were grave sites, but it's unclear if all of them were grave sites. Archaeologists are now paying more attention to the surroundings around the mounds to see uh, if they can gain more information about how these may have been used. In 1883, uh, Theodore Lewis came to Lake Minnetonka. He started a project that was privately funded to survey all the mounds in Minnesota, part of the Dakotas, part of Manitoba. And he actually surveyed 17,000 sites uh, and made maps of them. So that survey went from 1880 to 1895. And again, he came to Lake Minnetonka in 1883 and um, surveyed the mounds here. He seldom excavated, but he did collect, try to collect from local residents uh, artifacts that he could peruse that had been found. This is what one of his drawings looks like, one of his surveys from his field books. And this was a statement that he published in the Excelsior newspaper that was a summary of what the mounds contained. In 1911, uh, the state geologist um, Winchell, I'm trying to think of his name, Newton Winchell, Horace Newton Winchell, uh, published a compilation of Theodore Lewis's surveys. And um, so all of these maps that are shown in Winchell were based on Lewis's field notes. Again, we're, this is the um, kind of the southwest side of Big Island. And what, what's informative about this is that uh, when you see the detail on the right, these are Lewis's field notes, and compared to what Winchell published, you'll notice that things are missing. Um, when um, Lewis got there in 1884, he found a couple of intact mounds, but he also found a mound with a cottage built into it, and he found one uh, perched on the side of the bluff, half uh, eroded. But Winchell took that drawing and just made it very different. And so uh, I learned early in my career of talking to archaeologists that they don't look at Winchell, even though it's very accessible. Uh, if they're doing any serious research, they go right to the field notes, which have more detail.
it's sometimes really difficult to take Lewis's survey notes and figure out where he was. And some scholars have speculated that he wanted to keep the sites obscure so that no one could appropriate his work. This, this is the site on Big Island where uh, the, this is the cottage that was built into the mound that we saw. It was also the site in uh, 1904 where uh, they were excavating to put in a staircase from the house to the lake and found uh, two skeletons. Uh, this is a sidebar. I w went out into that area years ago and uh, at that time the Knudsons were living on Big Island in a cottage and uh, they took me inside. And so this is right at the site where that mound had eroded over the bluff. And in fact, they own that property. And when I saw this, I thought, oh boy, um, they indicated to me that they found these in the lake. And so I actually borrowed this board from them, took it to the university and had these analyzed because I thought, if these are human bones, then they need to be you know, repatriated or um, they shouldn't be hanging on a wall. Well, it turns out they were, uh, there were a couple of sheep bones and a, um, a cow bones, and uh, they were from uh, barbecuing on the beach. <laughs> but lots and lots of stone tools are found um, from the prehistoric era, and the one difficulty is that it's very hard to ascertain the age or the cultural group that these are affiliated with because they're all the same for thousands of years. There was uh, another burst of archaeological activity in the Lake Minnetonka area in the 1950s. Uh, Lloyd Wilford from the University of Minnesota came out and his question was, are the mounds in the Lake Minnetonka area affiliated with the Sioux people? Or are they from an earlier people? And he concluded that they were not, but he decided not to publish that finding because uh, it's not really clear. And in fact, archeologists are still uh, debating this question. Pottery is very commonly found in mounds and there's uh, some indication that obviously you need material for mounds to, to make them and often uh, debris is mixed in. In other words, um, either, you know, trash pits would be a, or trash heaps would be a obvious um, source of material. And so uh, one has to be careful in speculating about the material in the mound as to whether it was intended to be uh, put there for cultural or religious reasons or whether it in fact was just uh, refuse. There's uh, still some activity going, along, uh, going on in the Lake Minnetonka area, and, uh, but there aren't too many sites that are really intact uh, to produce any information. And I should say that archeologists no longer excavate mounds unless they're threatened in some way with uh, erosion or uh, some really important construction uh, project. I want to turn to dugout canoes because that's a really rich source of information. The dugout canoes were often left in the lake to um, sort of hide them uh, when, you, when the uh, Indians left the area for a period of time. They would leave their canoes in the lake, possibly to preserve them. And in fact, they are really well preserved. These are the three that uh, have been, uh, that are known and here are the dates that are determined from carbon dating. The first one is pretty well known. This was found in the North Arm in 1934. Uh, that was obviously the, that was the lowest year for lake levels and the uh, lake uh, had retracted considerably and this was, this was actually found in the water and then pulled up onto the uh, shore. And this is the canoe that is at the Western Hennepin Pioneer Museum um, in Long Lake. The second canoe is at Hochakata T at the Shakopee Minnewakanton community, and um, 
its association with Lake Minnetonka is a little bit more questionable than the others because um, it was bought from an antique dealer, Avery Stubbs, or Roger Stubbs rather, in uh, the Stubbs Bay area, Long Lake, and there are poor records about where it, uh, its provenance, where, where Stubbs got it. And um, the other issue with it is it's white pine, and we don't have white pine, uh, presumably in the Lake Minnetonka area when this was made. And so, and, they, and typically, these dugout canoes weren't transported very far. Uh, Javi Avalos is with us tonight, who's curator at the um, Hochakata Tea Museum. And I welcome him and may ask him a question if I get stoned. The last canoe is still on the uh, bottom of the lake at an undisclosed location. And um, this was found by a Maritime Heritage Minnesota diver um, and recorded by Maritime Heritage Minnesota. But um, for the moment, it's going to remain on the lake bottom. Our history, uh, our knowledge about the uh, Indians in this area really begins with the French who came into the area like officially in the 1630s, but there's speculation that maybe around 1600 there were illegal traders coming in to the area, bringing out furs, bringing in cloth, kettles, knives, uh, later firearms, traps, manufactured things that weren't available to the, the people in this area. Now, I think what's interesting about this is that there's so many place names that we can recognize. The Keweenaw is Keweenaw, and uh, Shigamigan up in uh, the uh, Madeline Island area. Uh, we have uh, recognizable uh, names for the native peoples. And what's interesting about this census is that only the men are counted, you will notice. And I think we should remember that this is a, a census that's made by business people who are going to trade with the native people. And so they're interested in the active male hunter-gatherers slash sometimes warriors, as they're referred to. Um, and they may not actually have met very many uh, of the um, women and children in these communities. They're trading with uh, the men. Now that would change later with the fur trade that women became much more active as, as you know, more, more um, active participants in the, in the trade. As I said, uh, these are the uh, furs that are bundled they actually compress them in presses and uh, tied them up as best, you know, to keep them as waterproof as possible. And then they would um, move them out uh, through the Lake Superior um, conduit through Montreal. Most of these furs were going to go to Europe, actually, and be made into beaver hats and other kinds of wools. This was a tough profession. Um, it was obviously very physical. They had to carry heavy loads around portages and they had to be very fit and they didn't get paid much. But I think it's useful to look at what the French knew in, this, in the 1600s and 1700s. So this map is from the early 1700s and it shows that knowledge stops uh, west of our area. Here's the Mississippi. And pretty much everything else is terra incognita. And in fact, uh, I think it's helpful to remember that the same people that were getting our information about the natives from uh, had wild conceptions about the geography of the area. Here's the Sea of the West that the French believed existed just to the west of us. Uh, they were obsessed with finding a trade route from uh, the East Coast through the Great Lakes to the West Coast and then to the Orient. And just to zero in on that early 
18th century map. Again, we can see place names that we recognize. Um, Illinois has changed to Michigan, but we've got Huron, Superior. Um, here are the Sioux of the West, I'm sorry, the Sioux of the East and the Sioux of the West. They're pretty far north. Um, we can reliably uh, look at these parallels of latitude because latitude is very easy to determine from the North Star. And so that's probably accurate. What's less accurate are these meridians of longitude. But um, they, this is one indication of how far north the uh, Dakota or the Sioux were in this period. And they were actually driven down by pressures from uh, Indians in this area, from the Iroquois Wars, and from the Ojibwe, which started to move westward across Lake Superior. Uh, and this, these were artifacts that were found on Big Island. And the archaeologists that I showed these to had the same problems that I discussed when I showed you the stone hammer, that these were made for so long that it's really impossible to date them accurately. The uh, Anglo-Americans that came um, obviously were very interested in acculturating, I guess you would say, the native people. And uh, this is a good example. Samuel Pound came in 1834 to Minnesota. He, um, came with his brother Gideon, and they wanted to convert the Dakota people to Christianity. That was their main thing. And to do that, they were, worked very hard, along with other missionaries, to make the Dakota language a written language. And so they invented an alphabet, they studied it intensely, and they actually formed a system of writing. Uh, which had, the Dakota people had not had before. Both the Pond brothers lived in Minnesota among the Dakota people. Um, they started out, um, I think, in uh, Kaposia, South St. Paul, and then moved to Lake Calhoun, where, or what we call Bidet Mahaska now, uh, where the um, Cloud Man's Band had moved in order to take up agriculture. So the government was interested in teaching the Dakota people um, farming. And that's what the Pond brothers first started to do. And then they became credentialed ministers and, and started to concentrate on missionary work. The site of the, um, where the Samuel Pond ended up was centered around this spring in Shakopee. And here is his house, which is now gone, although the foundation remains there. Um, he was at the Dakota village of Tintamwan, where there were 600 Dakota people. It was one of the largest Mittawakanton villages on the Minnesota River. Uh, he was in a community of fur traders. Um, Oliver Faribault had a post there fur trading post, which has survived and is now at um, Murphy's Landing or uh, The Landing, as it's called today. Sam and Gideon Pond made an effort to, as most missionaries did or most people did, to learn what the Dakota said about their own history. And of course, their history, as we said, was largely um, oral. And this is a long series of articles that Gideon published in the Dakota Friend, the newspaper that they published in St. Paul, that describe what they were told by the Dakota, um, in, you know, the, the history that the Dakota gave them. We know that Minnetonka is a um, Dakota word. Um, there's some indication that the Dakota didn't use place names in the same way that we did. They used more descriptive names. Samuel Pond, pretty early in an undated letter to his mother, came to Minnetonka, and here's how he wrote the word. Um, Paul Durand, who was a, a white person who studied uh, place names and published the Where the Waters Gather and the Where the Rivers Gather and the Waters Speak, which was a history of Dakota place names in Minnesota, thought this was the proper name. And then Andrew Williamson was the, the 
the son of a missionary and himself a missionary who collected uh, place names a little later uh, in the 19th century. The Dakota had a seasonal pattern. They, uh, this time of year, were preparing to go uh, set to camps to set up uh, their maple sugaring operations. And then the men, that was largely a female-oriented occupation. The men would go up the Minnesota River for furs. Then in May, there was a return to the villages. They planted squash and corn as a rule. There was gathering and hunting. This is a more developed field of corn that was um, on the lower, uh, Upper Sioux Reservation after the Treaty of 1851. And uh, June, August, more roots, fruits, fish, game. Fish was an important part of their diet. They ate those all year round. September, more furs, wild ricing, fruits. Both the maple sugaring and the wild ricing were considered really happy times for the Dakota because it was a, um, well, the one thing about the maple sugaring is that it meant the coming of spring. Here's a picture that, this is the only picture I've been able to find of wild rice on Lake Minnetonka. This is Halstead's Bay. And this is probably, this is a Seth Eastman watercolor, but it's probably Ojibwe or Anishinaabe because of uh, birch bark canoes. But here the women are gathering wild rice, which they would knock off the stalks into the canoes, and then they would bring it on shore and parch it, separate it and parch it. And then finally, from October to January, a long period of time, the deer hunt. Many of these activities brought Dakota out of the villages into the, in small groups, out into the region. And that's when they would visit Minnetonka. Now, Minnetonka isn't very far away, and it was in the big woods area, and so uh, easy to get to from the villages. Oops. Um, February was a period of rest and manufacture of things. Here's Minnetonka in proximity to the Minnesota River and the seven or eight um, Dakota villages. So Shakopee's village it was here. It's really about 11 miles from the lake. And these villages were, they had uh, both teepees and these bark huts made from elm bark. Notice, uh, this. I think this is a pilot knob. You can see the burial grounds up here. Um, this is probably early Mendota. And the, uh, you can see that all the canoes are dugouts. The birch bark canoe was here, but it generally was sourced from the Ojibwe up north that would bring them into this area. Um, this gives us some indication that they were relatively rare. Shakopee was a uh, third, a second or third generation chief at the Shakopee village. He died in 1860. He was uh, succeeded by his son, Shakopee the Younger. Uh, both of those Shakopees and this man, Cutnose, were known to visit the Lake Minnetonka area. We have pioneer accounts. Uh, these, the three were recognizable enough to the settlers that uh, they're often mentioned in, in, in the pioneer accounts. Cottage Island, on this early map from the 1850s, uh, was actually named for Dakota structures that were there. And so uh, I presume that they were bark lodges, like we saw in the earlier slide, and that they, uh, there were enough of them, and they were prominent enough, that the island acquired this name. And then what's interesting about this, this is, map is from the same period, Weezatonka. Uh, is the Dakota term for Big Island, Big Island. And uh, here, the map maker ascribed that. And finally, Minnetonka was also, you know, it was a term that um, was also applied after the Dakota were moved from this area to the Missouri River near Neobrara. And there, the Missouri widens and it was common for the Dakota in that area to call this widening of the river Minnetonka. Uh, 
we have good evidence that this was a very significant area. The Dakota were here frequently. There were well-worn trails between the village sites and the lake. They were here throughout the year. And uh, we know that there was a sacred site that we'll, we'll turn to shortly. The request to make Minnetonka the eastern uh, border of the reservation will, will also come to in a moment. I want to start with the Dakota sacred site. This is uh, up here in the upper left is Breezy Point, where uh, the, the Dakota Indians had a prayer stone. And the first pioneers called this uh, site Spirit Now. It had an eccentric deposit of earth. And on the top of that, there was a what the Dakota call a prayer stone. These stones are, uh, were, I think uh, it's fair to say they were themselves worshipped. They contained a spirit that was venerated, and they were often painted. Now, Pond says, Samuel Pond says that they were uh, often the size of a man's head, and that was the case of the stone at Spirit Now, but there were also boulders. And this one is still at Newport, actually. When the Dakota left this area, they asked the whites to continue to paint it, and that's continued. That that has continued. So this is at uh, it's at actually at the site of a church in Newport. The knob, its spirit knob, was photographed by several photographers. The stone, however, was stolen. The prayer stone was stolen almost immediately as the whites came into the area. Elizabeth Ellett, who came here in 1852 and wrote a book that she published in 1853 called uh, Summer Rambles in the West, uh, talks about the stone. She didn't, um, I'm not sure if she saw it, but it was described to her. And this is the best description that we have of this sacred stone at Minnesota, painted red, small yellow spots. Um, and then she describes the area where it was found, where there was apparently quite a lot of um, man-made artifacts surrounding it. And she does mention the offerings of tobacco and the fact that the stone was uh, being used uh, to celebrate the taking of scalps. We have three sites that are at least named by the whites as possible, you know, of religious significance. Um, it's, uh, these are Spirit Island, of course, is up by Wayzata Spirit Now we've discussed. Enchanted Island is on the upper lake, and it's, um, uh, it's not so clear that either the Spirit Island or Enchanted Island were legitimate uh, Dakota sites. There's not very good evidence. I want to turn to the U.S. Dakota treaties. <coughs> the, uh, there was a succession of them. Uh, the 1805 treaty gave the Fort Snelling area to the United States. It's been impugned as not being a legitimate treaty. It was never endorsed by the federal government. In fact, the federal government itself said that it was questionable in the 1890s. The 1837 treaty signed in Washington gave the uh, land that was basically east of the St. Croix River to the United States. 1841, I highlighted that in gray because it was never endorsed by the government, but it was a scheme to actually create a reserve that where the uh, Native Americans would be protected. Uh, west of Minnesota, in western Minnesota, but it failed. It, uh, it it was never ratified by the United States. Ten years later, we have the the really grave uh, treaties uh, at Traverse de Sioux and at Mendota. And I want to um, just emphasize that there are two different treaties, and there's a lot of confusion. Um, even in the literature about the treaties that, but two different treaties 
with two different groups of people. The first one, Traverse de Sioux, was the um, Sisseton and Wahpeton people, which are farther up the Minnesota River. The Mendota Treaty came about three weeks later, and that was with the um, Mittawakanton and the um, Wapakuti. And that was deliberate because the government thought that if we could get the Sisseton's to sign first, that would help the Mittawakanton's get convinced to sign this treaty. There was a lot of coercion and uh, dishonesty surrounding this treaty. And then in 1858, well, I should say the 1851 treaty placed the Dakota people on a reservation that was 10 miles on either side of the Minnesota River, basically from New Ulm to the South Dakota border. In 1858, the um, northern half of that reservation was summarily removed from the Dakota. And if we look at the official journal of the Treaty of Mendota, that's as part of the significance of the lake becomes manifest. One of Shakopee's brothers during the negotiation says, we don't want to be that far out on the Minnesota River on the prairies. We want our reservation to start at the big lake on Fall Creek, which is Minnetonka. But that didn't happen. The, there was some altruism on the part of the government with these treaties. They, they had, to some extent, the Native people's interests in mind, but there was so much um, influenced by the traders, and there was so much greed that happened um, that they became um, rather an embarrassment to the United States government. The, the, here are the five reasons I was able to find in, that the government was promulgating f for the treaties. Um, protecting the Indians from the whites and their nefarious schemes, teaching them farming, allowing them to acquire farms, and then later, and this is important, between 1851 and 1858, uh, the, the sense was that the communal lifestyle that the Dakota people enjoyed had to be destroyed. It, people had to live in families, in, you know, nuclear families, and not participate in communal endeavors. And of course, converting to Christianity and acquiring English were things that were thought would be uh, helpful in acculturating them, acculturating them. Gideon Pond said uh, this, I apologize, it's cut off, but the, um, he mentions in 1851 that the French introduced the system of chieftaincy. There used to be more of a democracy, and that, uh, that what happened was it broke the Mittawakanton community apart. And this is, the same thing happened with the 1858 Treaty of Washington, that uh, Joseph Brown, the, at that time the Indian agent, um, tried to, uh, he was the one that was really promulgating the idea that the community approach that the Dakota had had to be taken apart. And Nancy Wingard, who wrote the North Country book, uh, said this about him that uh, he didn't really realize that he was bringing the Dakota people to uh, a place where, uh, a place of conflict among themselves. Minnetonka is known in 1840 when Nicolette made his map there it is. It's kind of fun to watch as the survey comes west, um, how it begins to, I mean, people know it's there, but it begins to take better and better form. And finally, in the, I think this area was surveyed in 1854, late in 1854, 1856, the first maps from the federal government came out. Finally, we get to see Lake Minnetonka in the shape that we recognize it now. There's a sense that the lake was kept a secret from the whites, but I don't think that's actually re a reliable notion. The um, lake is in the big woods. Let's see if we can find it here, near Senefin County. And here's the big woods, this 
large area of hardwood forest which is isolated to the west are the prairies to the east is oak uh, not savanna but oak um, kind of oak prairie and in between is a really intense area of bramble and vine and um, it, it, it was almost impassable to get from the Fort Snelling area into the Lake Minnetonka area. Here's a more detailed view. Uh, here's the lake to the east. Of it it kind of defined the uh, eastern edge of the big woods in this area. One of the, this is, these are views from Edwin Whitefield, who's one of the, I think these are the first images of Lake Minnetonka actually produced. And he came in 18, 1855, 56 to the area and produced a series of watercolors. This is Hull's house on the Narrows. So the pioneers, the, the Dakota were, had signed the Treaty of 1851. It was endorsed a year later. In 1853, they were moved to the reservation. And, but they didn't stay there. It wasn't tenable. They actually continued to move through the area doing their seasonal cycle. And so the, we have lots of pioneer accounts of uh, their activity in the area. On Big Island, the pioneers saw what they thought was a Dakota fort, enclosing an acre. And there's a second description, Hezekiah Brake published this in 1896, but he observed it in the early 1850s. Old fort, slender logs in a circle. And probably what this, these are the possibilities I think that this fort on Big Island could have been. A deer corral could have been a defensive wall. They were known to the Dakota, a dance enclosure, or if they're making maple sh sugar, shelter from the weather. And that actually was Leonard Wapishaw's uh, explanation to me when I uh, discussed this fort with him. He said if they were making maple, sh maple sugar, they probably want us to do it outside of the wind and the cold. The treaties were, um, one of the, the ethical problems with the treaties was, the, was that the traders were siphoning off the money. The government was often paying the traders, hold, actually holding back the annuities and paying them directly to the traders. And one of the great crimes of the 1851 treaty was, was this, uh, there were two copies signed up here officially, and then the Dakota leaders were asked to sign a third paper called the Trader's Paper. And that actually was sort of an IOU. But they, there's a lot of evidence that, there's evidence for and against that they knew what this third paper was. Effectively, what it did was make it so that the payments that the United States government made to the Dakota were um, quite diluted. This is a uh, United States government survey map. This is the area where the uh, pond house was and the faribault cabin and the village of Tintanwan with uh, 600 people, Shakopee's village, and when this map was made in 1854, there's no trace of it. We all know about the 1862 U.S.-Dakota War, which erupted in August. Uh, part of it was that the annuities were late. Uh, it was a weird coincidence that the, the gold was being shipped from the Mississippi River to the reservation by wagon, but no one quite knew when it was gonna come. The government didn't like to advertise that there was a wagon load of gold you know, going up the river uh, for security reasons. And so the traders themselves, the Indian agents, didn't really know when it was coming. And the, uh, for various reasons, the Dakota people were starving and the revolt occurred. Um, Samuel Pond said it was the action of a mob. It wasn't a cohesive decision to try to drive the whites out of the Minnesota River Valley. Um, but in fact, that's what happened. At the lake, the, uh, this is the Governor Ramsey, Min Minnetonka's first steamboat, launched in 1860. 
and it brought people from Excelsior here out to Gales Island, except it broke down and drifted to shore in Tonka Bay. Uh, so, but by that time, the danger was over, and the messenger went to Tonka Bay by horse and said, it's OK, that's a false alarm. So the, the conflict never reached here, but it did. Um, th this area saw waves of refugees moving from the western frontier to Fort Snelling. John Otherday is well known for leading 62 people out of the conflict zone to Hutchinson and uh, was heralded as a, as a hero. His brother ended up in Eden Prairie. So I'm, uh, this is, here's a shot. He's just up the river. Murphy's Landing, the landing is on this peninsula. The Battle of Shakopee of 1858 was in this area. And uh, Jacob Otherday, which is John Otherday's brother, uh, actually established a colony, several buildings. And um, you can see this in the census of 1880, 1885, 1900. Various people, Dakota people, probably all family, are uh, living there and moving, moving through the colony. Um, and surprisingly, there are pictures that have survived of the, what I call the Eden Prairie Colony. It's on the river bottom. It survived in the other day's hands until 1948. So other day's brother was Jacob. And he, this, here's his Dakota name at the top, Oyate Kokepa. And he called himself that, and he called himself Other Day's brother on official documents, and he called himself Jacob Other Day, and he was also known as John Other Day. He and the people in the Eden Prairie co Colony came to the lake in the 1880s and were ricing. So 50 Dakota people, that's a pretty sizable group. As I said, John Other Day and Jacob Other Day are often confused. This is a picture from the Scott County Historical Society that's labeled Jacob Other Day, but it's clearly John, his brother. The other group that uh, we have visiting the lake is Joseph Campbell and his wife, Lena. And they stayed on Howard's Point. They evidently were, had moved though to Prairie Island in the period, but they would apparently come to, Min to Minnetonka nonetheless, where they had friends and work. Um, Joseph became um, a um, leader of the, of the Prairie Island community, and Lena became sort of the ethno-historian. Here's the census of 1900, and you can see that they're living with, uh, here's Joseph Campbell, Lena, or Lucy, and they're living in uh, Lena's parents' house. And in fact, I found a picture of it. And Joseph Campbell, the Howard's Point, Dakota, who would come back and visit, had a half-brother. So they had different fathers, same mother, with Joseph LaFranboise. And Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, David LaFranc was. And David and his wife Emma and David's mother, and sometimes his sister, would camp on Phelps Island. And they, both the, the Campbell family and the LaFranc was family uh, were here uh, summer after summer. A pair of moccasins that the LaFranc was sold to a cottager on Enchanted Island have survived uh, in, in the Minnesota Historical Society. This is a stone that David uh, produced that was supposedly a map stone. Uh, it's considered a fake now. Um, this is in the Carver County Historical Society. There's another stone that was found by an archaeologist on Big Island, which may or may not contain petroglyphs um, that is pretty similar to it, about the same size. It's got this weird square hole in it that no one can explain. The Dakota people here got incorporated into the tourist industry. They were um, sometimes hired to provide entertainment on the 
city of St. Louis, and there was actually an Indian encampment in Tonka Bay at the Vern West residence where they would charge uh, admission and uh, give dances. Of course, Tonka Bay had a gigantic hotel at that period, and uh, it no doubt provided local entertainment. I want to just talk quickly about some of the appropriated names and culture of, of the Dakota. Um, we have some well-known place names that were probably legitimate and learned from the Dakota. Uh, there are two that are from Longfellow, from his uh, Hiawatha poem that aren't even Dakota language, they're Ojibwe. We have a famous musical piece that was produced uh, in the late 19th century by Thurlow Lawrence, who actually didn't come to Lake Minnetonka until 20 years after he published this piece. And we had pageants here in Excelsior that for three years where the white people dressed as Dakota. And uh, they were aware that the Shakopee Dakota were there, and some of them did participate in these pageants. It's interesting how uh, this, some of this costume looks like it was borrowed from the Dakota, or there isn't a very good explanation for where some of the costuming came from. It's, it's quite, some of it seems to be authentic. This is a completely fake scene of Lake Minnetonka published in about 1890. I want to close with the legend of Ma Piata, which is a little complicated. The lake, um, the, I'm sorry, the island had this channel dredged by Olaf Cyril and his family in the 1890s, and, it, and this island was also produced. It didn't have a name. And in 1968, it was purchased by uh, this eccentric German architect, Franz Geil, and his wife, Jane Hauser Geil. And uh, that behind him is the house that they built on this island, which we now know as the Glass House. Uh, Franz had learned of this Ma Piata le legend, and he actually convinced the county to assign the name Ma Piata Island to the island. The uh, promulgator of this legend was actually Ward Burton's sister, Ariel. So this would be Hazen Burton's daughter, who was friends with uh, uh, Lucy, um, I'm, I'm not sure of her last name, but they, but they had this close association with some of the Dakota people in the Eden Prairie Colony and in the Shakopee area. And they were told this, uh, Ariel Burton was told this story in her youth by one of these Dakota people, and it was preserved and promulgated as the legend of Ma Piata. I think we all know it. If you're from Minnetonka, it was uh, Ma Piata was a, a young woman who intervened in a combat between the Ojibwe and the Dakota, and then was taken captive, brought up to Turtle Lake. 10 years later, she convinced her, cus her husband to come back to the Big Island, and, uh, and they made peace with the Dakota, which reigned for seven generations and they're buried on Big Island. Well, one problem with this is, well, one of the sources of this was Charles Eastman, uh, a pretty well-known Dakota activist, I guess you would say. He took a medical degree in the East, came back, was on the, uh, I think the Rosebud Reservation for a while, but he wrote a series of books about his uh, childhood and about Indian customs, Dakota customs. And here's a picture of him actually at the Burton Estate. And so he was one of the people that helped kind of refine and authenticate this legend. Uh, the problem with the legend is it's probably not about Lake Minnetonka. It was probably brought here and adapted to Lake Minnetonka because anthropologists uh, know that this was common with Dakota legends, that they weren't necessarily about a particular place. So um, I'm going to close with this slide, which is 
uh, shows that Mapi, we, we learned that this was Mapiata Island, but when the data went to the federal government from Minnesota, the federal government has a, like a bureau of names. They, I think they got confused because they thought, well, where's the island that they're talking about? They thought it must be this one. So for years, we have maps that actually are mislabeled. The um, best source of information that I recommend to people for that want to study the Dakota is Samuel Pond's book that he, um, he wrote in, late in his life. I think he died in 1890. The book first came out in 1908. It was first published as the Dakota or Sioux in Minnesota as they were in 1834 which is the year that the Pond Brothers came to Minnesota. And it's full of really fascinating material. It's a very balanced and fair uh, treatment. I, if you guys are interested, it, it, uh, I didn't really prepare a bibliography, but I do have one. And if you want to contact the Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society by email, uh, I will send you a list of reading material if you'd like to learn more. Um, support your historical society. There's um, an effort underway to combine the four historical societies. And so there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. And the reason this effort is being made is because the volunteerism isn't there. And lots of projects, these take human resources and they take money, so do what you can. Can I answer any questions? Yes, sir. There's a north area on Bushwick Road, just north of the causeways, Great Bay Causeways, on the west side, the London the question was, there's an area west of Bushaway Road where it's undeveloped and it looks like there's mounds. I think um, what you, I mean, you could try the state archaeologist's office. They may or may not tell you. There's kind of a varying philosophy as I moved through my career. It was like at first it was like don't tell anybody where the mounds are and then it was like tell everybody where the mounds are, put signs on them so they're not disturbed. And now we're back to sort of, well, tell certain people. But so you could try this you could try the state archaeologist's office. If that isn't fruitful, you could look at Winchell and try to identify them yourself. Because it's never it's not developed it's pretty large area. Yeah. I, I know from the map that we saw at the beginning that, that there is a dot there for clusters, and of course we all know about the Bushaway Road. Um, it, what was it, a roundabout that was put in, and it was put in, the, the Dakota said, you guys didn't do your homework, you knew where there were mounds there, and uh, they, they thought that the state transportation department was incompetent. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.